All right, uh, let's start. We left off last time on the k-means algorithm. We went through the algorithm itself. Uh, we had an example uh, where we did k-means in two dimensions, uh, and we started talking about uh, uh, selecting k, and there we bumped into the issue, k, the number of clusters that you want to have, uh, because k-means expects you to start by saying how many clusters you want. And we talked about the difficulty in selecting k. Uh, basically, there is no good way to do this. You either do this visually from a screen plot, uh, or you have to come up with a way to evaluate your clustering output to see how good it is, and then pick the k that gives you the best output. Um, so we're talking about evaluating algorithms, and that uh, eva evaluating clustering algorithms, and that turns out to be really hard. Uh, so there's basically two ways to do it. The reason it's hard is clustering is an unsupervised task. You don't have, a, you're not predicting anything specific, so you can't measure how accurate uh, your predictions are because you're not predicting anything. You're trying to understand the data. So the way you evaluate clustering algorithms is you either use an extrinsic method, so you use clustering as a pre-processing step, and then see does it help you do something that you really want to do. Right, so you could use clustering, say, to represent images uh, in terms of cluster regions, and we'll have an example of how you would do that. Or you could maybe fit a different classifier or use different parameters of your learning algorithm, depending on which cluster you end up in. Or um, you could use it maybe to uh, identify outliers. Um, and in all cases, you're not evaluating clustering directly, you're just saying, I run clustering as a pre-processing step. Now, does my classifier become better as a result of this processing, or does it stay the same? Right, and that's that basically tells you whether your clustering is any good or not. Um, so that's extrinsic. Um, you can also try to evaluate clustering intrinsically. So, how good is it in and of itself? But that turns out to be really hard. Right. So, why do you do clustering? You're trying to understand the data, and <coughs> understanding the data is a subjective thing. Right, so you run clustering, you get some clusters, do they help you understand the data? Uh, yes, they probably do. Now, can you put a number on how well they help you understand the data? Uh, probably not. So, so it's something that you do qualitatively, it doesn't help you, uh, you, you can come up with a number here. <clears throat> so what can you do? Um, well, if you have some reference clusters, right, so for example, if you're clustering handwritten digits, then you know that these digits better have 10 classes, because there are only 10 digits. Um, so you could see how well your the output of your clustering algorithm lines up to those reference clusters, so that's one way to evaluate it. Uh, <clears throat> or uh, you could basically try to formalize this process of how good your clusters are. So uh, you, you, you basically ask humans to generate some uh, a small set of labels and then use that to see how good your clusters are. And we'll talk about both of them now. Right, so let's talk about the first one. So suppose you have this set of reference clusters, R1 through Rn, however you came up with it, th those could be your 10 uh, digits or, or any other reference clusters. But the assumption is that this is what you want to reproduce. You want your system to output that. Now you run your clustering system and it outputs C1, C2 through Ck. So it outputs some clusters, and the number of clusters could actually be different from the number that you're looking for, unless you, unless you pick k um, equal to n. <clears throat> so, uh, so you have a set of reference clusters, you have a set of systems clusters. How do you figure out if they are a good match to each other? And the way you do this is you start by lining up reference clusters to what your system produces. And uh, so basically what I'm saying here is through whatever procedure, I'm going to line up C1, the first output, to R2, and C2 to R1, and C3 to R3, and C4 doesn't get aligned to anything. Okay, so, um, and once I do that alignment, uh, once I know that C1 is supposed to go with R2, I can just look at the uh, intersection of C1 and R2 and compute my normal things. So things that are both in C1 and R2 are my true positives, Things that are only in C1 are my false positives, and these are my false negatives. And I can use those to build any of the metrics that we discussed in the evaluation lecture. Um, first of all, why do you need this alignment step anyway? Why am I not just why am I not just lining up C1 to R1 and C2 to R2? Can I do that? That'd be easier. Right? Yeah. So the point is, yes, I could do it. 
but this pairing could be just totally bogus. Uh, the fact that this is C1 and this is R1, the 1 in there doesn't really mean anything, right? My system outputs clusters in arbitrary order. There is no particular ordering to the clusters. So what you want to do is you want to sort of give it the best chance that it has, right? So you want to try to align each cluster with the best possible reference for it. That's why you need this alignment step, right? So uh, there are many different strategies for aligning clusters uh, to reference clusters. Uh, what Weka does, what you'll be playing around with, is Weka takes each cluster that the system produces, that's your CJ, uh, and lines it up with a reference cluster with which it has the biggest overlap. So that's the first step, right? So if I did it like that, that's what sort of uh, that's that's what it would look like, right? I have my uh, the clusters that my system output as the rows, the reference clusters as the columns, and the numbers here represent <laughs> how many instances, say, from R2 fell into C1. So I know that. Reference cluster R2 was split between C1, C3, and C4, and most of R2 went into uh, C3, right? Uh, so I have seven instances there. So, so uh, what Weka does for each one of the clusters, it's going to find the biggest number in the row and align it to that particular uh, reference cluster. So C1 would be aligned to R2, because it has the biggest overlap. C2 will, would be aligned to R3, because that's the only document that it has uh, in the overlap. And C3 would be aligned to R3 um, as well. <clears throat> now, once Weka does that, uh, it, you see that in this case, when, when you just look at the crude overlap, you get two clusters that are assigned to the same reference cluster. And that turns out to be a problem. So uh, Weka solves that by going back and then getting greedily getting rid of those cases. So in this case, uh, it's going to say, well, look, R3 was aligned to both C2 and C3. I can't have that, so I got to move one of them. Right? So I can either move R3, uh, I can either move C2 to a different cluster, or I can move C3 to a different cluster. And, um, and let's say that it decides to move um, C2, right? So it, it's going to pick another uh, reference cluster, another reference pair uh, for it. So, uh, and now it's fine. Now C1 is aligned to R2, C2 is aligned to R1, and C3 is aligned to um, R3. So I have for each cluster that my system outputs, I have a reference, cl uh, reference cluster. They're paired up. Uh, C4 doesn't have a pair, just because I have fewer reference clusters. I can't have a one-to-one -one with three and four. Um, and once I've done the lining up, um, I can actually compute accuracy, right? So now, C1 is aligned to R2. So three documents or three instances that were both in C1 and R2, these are my true positives, right? And these seven and two, these are my, these are my false negatives. They should be in C1, but they're not, right? And one and two are my false positives. They're in C1, but they shouldn't be there, right? So uh, it's easy and you can compute the numbers and you can compute, say, the overall accuracy uh, for this alignment would be 3 plus 0 plus 8, so that's the number of uh, true positives, and you divide by the total, uh, by the total <coughs> uh, number of instances in the data, which is 26 in this case. Great. So um, that's what Weka does. Uh, it is a greedy, and this process of moving around after you've done the initial alignment is greedy. It basically takes one row and, uh, and moves the cell around. And the reason that it's greedy, uh, you could try to do it optimally, but if you did it optimally, the complexity for that is that. It's basically the number of pairings between two sets of items. And that's a really, really big number. So uh, optimizing over that many possible alignments is, is not feasible. That's why Weka does it greedily. Um, but you're looking at this and you might ask, well, why do we need this, why do we need this juggling around anyway? Right? Why can't we have different system clusters aligned to one a reference cluster like we have there, C2 and C3 were both aligned to R3. Why can't we have, um, why can't we have that? Um, and the reason we can't have that is if we did that, then our evaluation metric, this evaluation metric, this way of judging how good your clustering is, would become uh, cheatable. Uh, and what I mean by that is you could construct a really, really dumb 
clustering algorithm that would give you 100% accuracy. It wouldn't be very useful, but it would have a very high accuracy rate. Can you think of a way to do that? How could you, how could you cheat this metric if you allowed multiple system clusters to be assigned to the same reference cluster? Just have some clusters with everything in it? You directly out? Have some clusters with everything in it. No, that wouldn't work very well. Nice. So the answer is you have a separate cluster for each data point. So you have a bunch of singleton clusters. Each cluster contains just one data point. And then what's going to happen at evaluation time, each cluster is a singleton, so it's going to be aligned to the correct reference one. And the number that are aligned is going to be exactly as many instances as you want to have in your reference set. Right? So the reference set will pick out exactly the clusters that it wants to have there. Right? And of course, is that a useful clustering? No, it's not much of a clustering at all. It, it puts every instance into its own cluster. But that would have 100% accuracy. Right? So you can't do that. You cannot allow multiple system clusters to correspond to the same reference cluster. Can you do the opposite? Can you have multiple reference clusters correspond to a single system-generated cluster? Who thinks yes? Now, it's kind of a giveaway, right? No, but why? Because you can have one cluster? Yes. So this time, you can actually do the opposite. If I put everything into one big cluster, then all of the reference clusters could be lined up to that one big cluster, and again, you would have 100% accuracy. Right? And of course, again, that is not a very useful clustering. The whole purpose you cluster is you want to separate things into subgroups. And if you leave things in one group and allow multiple assignments, then you get 100% accuracy. Right? So again, you can't do something like that. That's why Weka has this step for, uh, and, and it's not, not just Weka. Whenever you try to evaluate clustering in this manner, you have to make sure that you have a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, clusters and uh, reference clusters. Okay, so here's one more tricky question. Can you, uh, now k-means doesn't produce overlapping clusters, but some techniques, some algorithms do. If you evaluate in this way, can you have overlapping clusters? Would you be able to cheat this way of evaluating if you produced overlapping clusters? So you don't allow multiple assignments. You don't do that. You don't do that. But just with this strategy, can you get a system that looks like it's 100% accurate always? One big cluster. No, this wouldn't work. I mean, one big cluster only works if you allow multiple RIs for the same CJA. But we're saying we're not letting that happen. OK, think about what's going to happen if you output a power set. So you have a set of instances, and your clustering algorithm outputs all possible subsets of that set. Okay. Now, for each one of the reference clusters, each one of the reference clusters, by definition, is a subset. So it is going to be in the power set. So the power set will contain a perfect match for every one of the reference clusters. It's going to contain a bunch of junk as well, but it's going to contain all the perfect clusters as well. Right? So, uh, and is a power set useful as the output of a clustering algorithm? No, it's not. It's basically saying, here are all the subsets. You pick the ones you like. And of course, you can find the ones that are perfect for any set of reference clusters. Okay. So with this technique, you cannot have uh, overlapping clusters. So uh, it looks like a simple thing. You've got a set of uh, system clusters. You've got a set of reference clusters. Just line them up and evaluate them. And it turns out that it's really kind of complicated because you need an alignment strategy and you need to enforce all sorts of rules and restrictions. And if you don't, it's very easy to cheat this metric. OK, so how else could you evaluate clustering? Here's another way. Um, and in this way, what you do is you don't have these reference clusters. Um, <clears throat> We're going to do evaluation in terms of pairs, right? So, uh, and this is often done when you have a big data set. Uh, you want to evaluate how well your clustering is working. Um, 
So these are my items, and I have some human annotators who can do some work for me. Now, what I cannot do is I cannot ask the humans to cluster this data set manually, right? Because that is a level of effort that's just too hard. It, it's impossible for humans to, to cluster a big data set manually, right? I give you a billion instances, you're, you're never going to finish this. Right? Now, what I could do is I could take this data set, I could sample some pairs from it, pairs of instances, give them to you, and ask you to tell me if those pairs should go into the same group. Right? So I could say, uh, here's an A and here's an B, would you like to see them in the same cluster? Here's a C and D, and would you like to see them in the same cluster? Cognitively, that is an easy task, because you just have two things, you know, maybe two emails uh, or two images, and you're asking, should they go in the same cluster or not? It's just a yes-no decision. So it's easy for humans to do, and they can generate a reasonable number of pairs uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Now, once you have this set of pairs, you can use it for evaluating lots of clustering systems. And the way you do that is you run your clustering system on your data, uh, it outputs a certain set of clusters, and then you start counting errors, right? So A and B was a positive pair, my, uh, my annotator thought that they should be in the same group, and lo and behold, they end up in the same cluster in my output, right? So A, B is a true positive. It right. should be in the same group, and my cluster puts it in the same group. Uh, C and D uh, should not be in the same group, but my cluster put them there, right? So that's a false positive. <clears throat> uh, let's see, E and H should be in the same cluster, but they're not, so that's a false negative. And uh, what else do I have? I have G and H, they should not be in the same cluster, and they're not. So that's a true negative, okay? So this way you can use the set of pairs to count true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, and then again evaluate in the ways that we've discussed. So compute accuracy or F1 or whatever, uh, whatever you want to compute. <clears throat> so uh, now one really nice way, uh, one really nice thing about this evaluation strategy is you don't need to pair up reference clusters and uh, system output clusters. So it doesn't have this expensive step that was greedy uh, or very expensive and imposes lots of restrictions. You don't need to do it if you if you do a pair-based evaluation. Uh, you can also handle overlapping clusters. It becomes a little bit tricky, but it's doable, right? So for example, if I have overlapping clusters, so this is a cluster as well, then uh, a pair G and H, which was in my data as a negative, it counts both as a true negative and as a false positive, right? Because it occurred in different clusters, so G occurred in this blue cluster and in this, and H occurred in this one, so it's a true negative for that, uh, but they also occurred in the same cluster, so they count both as a true negative uh, and a false positive. So your definitions get a little bit uh, uh, murkier, but, uh, but, but you can still count things in a very straightforward way, and it's, uh, it's a lot harder to cheat this than, than to cheat um, an evaluation that's based on, on an alignment. Um, and of course, uh, you can always generate pairs from classes, right? So if somebody gives you a set of reference uh, uh, clusters, you could always generate a bunch of pairs and then use a paired evaluation.